Brucham Aboyim. Again, welcome to our house. Thank you for attending. So, this week on my thoughts, I would like to examine the connection between water and between Torah. The intent being to demonstrate why our sages compare Torah to water. Now, it is a fact of life that without water a person cannot survive. Our bodies are comprised of approximately 16%, 60% water. We can survive without food for a period of a week to 10 days. However, we can only live three days without water. Plants are made up of anywhere between 85 to 95% water. For, for even the earth itself that we live on is comprised of 75% water. So in reality, the most precious liquid in nature is not oil, it is water. Water is the sperm of creation and makes everything grow. The fuel that runs the engine of the world is not oil, it is water. And just as the fuel that runs the engine of your body is water, when your body is dehydrated, you have, in essence, run out of gas. Your needle is on E. You know, I would like to examine the condition called dehydration. Wikipedia defines dehydration as a lack of total body water with an accompanying disruption of the metabolic process. It has been estimated that 75% of all Americans suffer for some degree of dehydration. The most common symptoms of dehydration include headache, lightheadedness, constipation, and bad breath. Think of dehydration as your car running out of gas. It can bring your whole body to a complete stop, making you totally immobile. You know, a couple of years ago, my wife and I took a road trip to Georgia for a Passover retreat. I drove to Georgia since my wife doesn't like to fly. Well, it's, it's not really the flying that bothered her. <laughs> it's the crashing. She defines the time spent in an airplane as hours of boredom, interrupted by minutes of terror. So anyways, we drove. The trip took some 15 hours, and I was bothered by the fact that I had to stop so many times for bathroom breaks. So on the return trip, well, I decided not to drink any water. I reasoned that if I didn't drink, well, I wouldn't be bothered with stopping as much. <laughs> Guess what? It worked. But I didn't realize that in the meantime, I had dehydrated myself. And then to make matters even worse, when I got home, I forgot to drink plenty of water to compensate for the fact that I hadn't drank anything on the trip home. Well, the next day, huh, I paid the price. I was dehydrated and I literally collapsed. My body went limp and I fell to the floor. I was lucky that my wife was with me at the time and she guided me down as I crumbled to the bathroom floor. I lay there and I was barely able to move any part of my body. I made an attempt to get up, but I was totally immobile. My wife had to call EMS, and they transported me by ambulance to emergency. At the hospital, they put me in an IV, which replaced the fluids that I had lost, and I was able to re return home shortly. But <laughs> I had learned my lesson. I now make it a point to stay hydrated at all times even if it means I have to stop more often for bathroom breaks. You know, many people who pass out from dehydration suffer serious injuries, especially if they hit their head as they fall. The damage that one can create by dehyd dehydration can be devastating, even life-threatening. However, there is a simple solution. Just drink more water. In religious writings, we also find, often find that water is compared to Torah. Our sages tell us that when God Almighty created the world, he first looked into the Torah as a sort of blueprint for its creation. When we look at the description of creation in the book of Genesis, the book of Bereshit, nowhere does it mention that God created water. It was seen that water preceded this world, since at the beginning of creation, the Torah tells us that God Almighty separated between the upper waters and the lower waters. The Medrash Rabbah and Shir HaShirim in the book of Songs which compares water to Torah states. As water extends from one end of the world to the other, <clears throat> so too does the Torah extend from one end of the world to the other. As water is life for all the world, so too the Torah is life for all the world. As water is free for all, so too is Torah free for all. 
as water descends from heaven, so too does Torah descend from heaven. As water is introduced with thunderous noise, so too was the Torah introduced with thunderous noise when God Almighty uttered the words, Anochia Hashem Elokecha, that I am the Lord your God. As water refreshes a person's body, so too does Torah refresh a person's soul. As water purifies a person from uncleanliness, so too the Torah purifies a person from uncleanliness. And just as water leaves a high place and flows to a low place, so too does Torah leave a haughty-minded individual and cling to a person who is humble. These are only some of the many examples that connect Torah and water. Now, you know, the first mitzvah, the first commandment that is mentioned in the Torah is Peru or Vu. Be fruitful and multiply. A commandment to bear children. This commandment is connected with water. A religious couple cannot participate in marital relations while the wife is still experiencing her menstrual period. When her period ends, the couple is required to wait an additional seven days. Then on the seventh night, she may immerse herself in a mikvah, a ritual bath. It is only then, after she has totally immersed herself, that the couple can once again resume their normal marital relations. Wikipedia states that a mikvah is a bath used for the purpose of ritual immersion in Judaism to achieve ritual purity. For a mikvah to be ritually pure, it must contain a minimum of 40 saw of water. 40 saw would be approximately 200 gallons of predominantly rain water. In the desert, the water that sustained the children of Israel during their 40-year journey in the desert was provided in the honor of Miriam. That being the case, Miriam is therefore credited with the birth of all the children that were born during those 40 years. Since without the well of Miriam, which was a virtual sea of water, there could not have been any way for the women to ritually purify themselves. That being the case, they could not have engaged in marital relations. As I mentioned earlier on a physical level, a person can only live three days without water, which coincides with the study of Torah. You know, Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, our teacher, instituted that the Torah should be read congregationally from a Torah scroll on Monday, Thursday, and Saturday. He did this so as to ensure that no more than three days should pass without learning some Torah. As he recited in the evening prayers, Ki heim chayenu the orech yameinu, for it, the Torah, is our life and the length of our days. Which is an allusion to the fact that just as physical dehydration can injure and even bring death about, so too spiritual dehydration can bring about urge, injury and death to the soul of a Jew. Since the life force of a Jew is Torah, as our sages tell us, God and his Torah are one. You know, water seeps in, even into the smallest crevices and so, too, Torah is connected to all facets of life. There's nothing that can exist without it. Water is the physical seed of creation, and Torah is the spiritual seed of creation. Light cannot exist without either. There are even special prayers that we recite, thanking God Almighty for bringing the rain. You know, in times of drought, the rabbis would declare fast days with special penitential prayers, beseeching God Almighty to bless the land with rain. There are many similarities that exist with water in religious observance. Water cleans and resuscitates the body on a physical plane. On a spiritual plane, Torah purifies the body from spiritual defilement. You know, we use water to remove the spiritual defilement of, the de of death, the greatest of all spiritual defilements. When a person returns from a cemetery, they are required to wash away the spiritual impurity of death from their fingers, which they picked up being into a cemetery. Our sages tell us that sleep is considered to be one sixtieth of death. So when we wake up in the morning, we wash both of our hands. This is predicated on the belief that when you wake up from a night's sleep, the impurity of death leaves your body, but a certain residue remains on your fingertips. It is this water that water has the ability to remove this impurity from your fingers. In fact, the Hebrew word for mayim, spelled mem, yud, and a final mem, 
these letters can be broken up into two words, may, mem. Now the word may in Hebrew means water, and the letter mem has a gematria, a numerical value of 40, which our sages tell us alludes to the fact that for a mikvah to be ritually pure, it must contain a minimum of may, mem, 40 saw of water. Even a drop less would invalidate the mikvah. The gematria of the word mayim is 90. As I've mentioned many times in my lectures, the number 9 alludes to truth. God Almighty created this world with <clears throat> 10 sphero, 10 character traits. 9 times 10, truth times, again, these spheroes, equal 90, in allusion to the fact that each of these sphero character traits represent truth. We read that, the, that our sages refer to the Torah as a sea of knowledge. Now we view the Torah on two levels, revealed and concealed. This is alluded to by the Hebrew word mayim. The first mem is open, which is an allusion to the revealed parts of Torah. The yud, the smallest letter in the Hebrew alphabet, alludes to God Almighty, who according to Kabbalah created the upper world with the letter yud, and also a sign of his humility. And then the final mem, which is closed, alluding to the concealed parts of Torah, such as Kabbalah, mysticism. We read in the Torah that our forefathers dug wells. Many of these wells were plugged up by the local residents. The Hebrew word for a well is the air. It is spelled Beis, Aleph, and Aresh. These three letters have, are an acronym for the Hebrew words, Biyadicha, Afkid, Ruchi. In your hand, I place my soul. The Hebrew word for spring of, of water is ma'ayim. It has within it the Hebrew word ayim, which means eye. Just like an eye rests in water that remains within the eye socket, unless one cries and then it overflows. So too a fountain is composed of water that stays in the ground, unless it overflows. During the temple period, any kohen, any priest, who would minister in the temple would be required to wash both their hands and feet from the kir, from the wash basin. Now the kir was conveniently placed in the temple courtyard so that the kohanim, the priest, would, could wash before they performed any service. If the priest failed to wash their hands or feet, any service that they would perform would be invalid. The kohen gadol, the high priest, would officiate on the holiest day of the year on Yom Kippur. He would personally perform all of the rituals of the day. In the process, he would immerse himself in a mikvah five separate times. If a regular priest would become spiritually defiled, they could not serve in the temple until they immersed themselves in a mikvah. Now, even a regular Jew would be required by Torah law to immerse in a mikvah for varied reasons, one such as contact with the dead or any object or person who had contact with a dead body. A leper, a person who was quarantined with a skin disease, would only be allowed to re-enter society after they were pronounced pure by the Kohen. They would then be required to immerse themselves in a mikvah as part of their purification process. A convert on the day of their conversion immerses in a mikvah, in addition to a woman who has given birth to a child, who must first immerse in a mikvah before she can resume normal marital relations with her husband. You know, many Hasidim have a custom to immerse in a mikvah daily. There are others who go on Friday or, the Shab or before the Shabbat. Some only go before the holidays, especially the high holidays. Both a chassan and a kala, a bride and a groom, go to the mikvah on the day of their marriage. It is said that going to a mikvah is not a mitzvah yet. The spiritual benefits that one can attain from immersing in a mikvah are even greater than many mitzvot. So washing is a ritually is ritually part and parcel of Judaism. You know, the day begins with the washing of one's hands immediately upon waking in the morning, washing every time that one relieves themselves, washing before one eats bread, and then again after the meal, before they recite the grace after meal, again after the bread. Washing our hands before one prays to God Almighty. Taking a shower before the Shabbat or holidays. Washing is also an integral part of the ritual of preparing a body 
before it is buried, called the Tahara. In the 14th century, the bubonic plague, also known as the Black Plague, broke out in Europe and Asia. Though the plague affected the Jews, somehow they weren't dying in the same numbers as were their Gentile neighbors. The non-Jews therefore accused the Jews of poisoning the water. One of the reasons that many Jews were spared the fate of their Gentile neighbors can be attributed to the fact that Jews constantly wash their hands and their bodies. Whereas in the old world, there were actually people who never took a bath in their whole lives. It is estimated that anywhere between 75 to 200 million people died in that plague. We live in an age where at least 75% of the world population are spiritually dehydrated. You know, you would think that during the COVID pandemic that people would have turned to God. Yet somehow, the number of people who attend, attended religious services fell. This trend has continued to fall. Only 16% of Americans attend weekly religious services, according to the PRRI, the Public Religion Research Institute. So we witness that physically as well as spiritually, we live in a time in history where the world population is dehydrated. Is it little wonder then that we witness that the world st is starting to crumble we need to resuscitate our bodies and our souls. We need to train ourselves to drink more water and to learn more Torah. If we don't change how we are living our lives, we will pay the price. We are putting our bodies and our souls in jeopardy. So let us remember that it is a necessity of life that we drink enough water daily. So the question that we should ask is, how much water is enough water? Doctors recommend that an adult male under, the, under normal circumstances should drink a minimum of six to eight glasses of water a day. Six and eight, 68, is the gematria, the numerical value of the Hebrew word chayim, life. The late Lubavitcher Rebbe Menachem Mendel Schneerson, of blessed memory, quoting the Shulchan Aruch, the code of Jewish law, would say that a Jew should learn some Torah in the morning and then again in the evening. So let us drink more water and let us learn more Torah. And with that advice, we will hopefully live in a happier and healthier life, both physically and spiritually. You know, tonight, I would like to conclude with a prayer to God, our Father in Heaven. May the merit of all the Torah learned, all the prayers offered, all the Psalms recited, all the many tears that have been shed, be enough to break open the gates of Heaven. We cry out to our Father in Heaven, that it is time to usher in the coming of Mashiach Tzukainu quickly and to put an end to all the suffering and pain in the world, especially for the hostages and for those injured, some physically, others mentally, and all the mourners. We beseech you, dear Father, to protect and bless all Jews all over the world, especially our brothers and sisters in the land of Israel. We ask for a special blessing for our brave Israeli soldiers serving in the IDF. May you watch over them and bring them all back safely with the Mashiach Sukeno leading them home from victory now. Again, thank you very much for listening. Appreciate you doing so. Again, please, if you can, help the Jewish soldiers in the land of Israel, our sisters and brothers, again, with your prayers, with the Psalms, uh, if you don't understand what you're saying, just saying the Psalms makes a difference. And again, if you can donate, please do so as well. The Israeli economy is totally on hold as all these soldiers are serving. So again, thank you very much for listening. God bless you, and please uh, stay tuned. Then we'll have a, another new song that I wrote, an original song that I'll perform. Thank you again. God bless. Be well. Shabbat Shalom.